I am Katina Horton, the Love and Freedom Toxic Relationship Recovery Coach. And today I've got a message for you. It is entitled, Four Ways That the Narcissist Creeps Into Houses. Once again, Four Ways That the Narcissist Creeps Into Houses. A person who is a creeper is a sneaky person. They move in a worm-like fashion. And they make sure that you don't hear them coming in and you don't hear them doing what? Leaving out, right? Luther Vandross had a song that he was singing back in the day and it's still popular. It was entitled, She Creeps, right? And so a part of the lyrics said, look at her, she creeps. Oh yeah, I can see you walking down the street. You don't like to walk, you creep. Into my show enough dreams, you creep. And so creepers, they smile, they smirk, and rejoice in the fact that they have manipulated, gaslit, and tricked you into giving your whole body to them, <laughs> right? And three other women at the same time, he creeps. Creepers appear to be mysterious and sexy and wise when they're nothing but covert narcissists. He creeps. Over in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says, but know this, hard times will come in the last days for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power, avoid these people, okay? And the power they're talking about these people are denying is the power of the Holy Spirit. So that means that these particular individuals that this these uh, sets of verses are talking about, they are denying the Holy Spirit. So if you're denying the Holy Spirit, that means what you... you inviting, right, demonic forces and the powers of Satan to come in is what's going on, right? And when you have the form of something, right, you've got the form of something that could be the outline of something. That's basically the appearance of something. So anyone can walk around with the form of something as they say, don't judge a book by its cover, right? That book's cover can have the form of godliness being inside and it can have all kind of inappropriate uh, sexual perversion inside. We just never know, right? People have the form of godliness, right? The form of a person with a good attitude and a good heart. We don't know until they start opening up their mouths. And then when you look at, um, in the scripture, it says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So you think about it, Saul had the form of a king, right? King Saul. Absalom, who was trying to take over his date, his uh, father, David's kingship, he had the form of a king. Both Absalom and Saul were spoken of in a very positive manner as far as their outward appearance and being tall. And then the scripture spoke of Absalom as like not having a blemish from head to toe, right? So they both had the perfect form of a king. David's brother Eliab had the form of a king. But when Samuel got ready to what? Anoint him, God's like, no, this is not the one. Man looks on the outer appearance. God looks on the heart, right? And so when we obey God and we walk a life that's centered on God, right? And our hearts are in the right posture. We know that it's not just the form of godliness, right? We have godliness uh, exuberating, so to speak, from our whole entire spirits and just permeating, right? And so God gave the people Saul as a king, right? And his name means asked for. So God gave them what they asked for, right? It's not what they needed because he was their king. He was the king of their hearts, but they asked for something else and he gave it to them. He gave them asked for in the person of Saul, right? And so we know when we have a lust for and it turns into an asked for, right? Then what we've <laughs> done is opened up a no more door because when we lust for something and then we ask for it and then God goes ahead and gives it to us to show us that we really don't need it. And then we're like, no more, no more, no more. I don't want any more of this. Right. But at that point, it's usually what 
it's too late. You've gotten too much of a good thing, so to speak. <laughs> it's not a good thing. It was a bad thing dressed up as a good thing, like the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? And so for some reason, instead of avoiding these type of people, when I say these type of people, I'm talking about the creepers, right? The covert narcissistic creepers. Instead of avoiding them, we find ourselves engaging with them. We like mess. We're attracted to drama, trauma, chaos, and confusion. We become addicted to those things, right? So if we watch the news and we read a news story, you hear the news, and they say avoid going down 51st Street. For some reason, the whole ground has opened up and three cars went inside. And then you go ahead. You didn't forget. You want to go look and see what happened. You like <laughs> drama, trauma, chaos, and confusion because you've decided you are not going to avoid that street. And it's the same thing with these type of individuals. There is no mystery when it comes to these particular type of individuals. I don't care what setting it is. Everybody knows who the troublemakers are. They know who the covert narcissists are. At first, you don't know. After a while, you see all kind of mess going on. Just everywhere you turn, all kind of mess, whether it be at, uh, in families or at uh, workplaces, or it could be in churches, or it could be in ministry, you know, and uh, out in the world in general. You go to certain grocery stores, customers are trying to avoid getting a certain uh, cashier's lines. People know who the uh, creepers are, but instead of avoiding them, what do we do? We entertain the mess. We like mess, right? And so then going further reading in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says, for all uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jans and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So uh, basically what happens is when you have people who are narcissistic, right? They have that narcissistic character brokenness, right? Like I just mentioned, everybody knows who they are. But instead of avoiding them, what happens is that we entertain the trauma, drama, chaos, and confusion that they bring along, and even the envy, right? And then we think that we can interact with these particular individuals and nothing is going to happen. That's not true. Just like physical toxins come in from a home, right? If you live in a home that's infested with black mold, uh, just infected with <laughs> black mold, you're going to be sick, right? And it's the same thing when it comes to spiritual, emotional, and mental toxins. They're going to do the same exact thing. When people are not healed, they walk around with holes in their body and they're just bleeding out all of their emotional, mental, and spiritual toxins, right? And so the thing about it, when verse seven, it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. For some reason, when it comes to individuals, who have toxic character brokenness, and that's the kind that creep into these houses, right? They learn and learn and learn and learn. And they do all this learning, but there is a disconnect in what they're learning and what they're actually able to uh, apply. They cannot take that situation, right, that has happened 2,000 times and learn for them. This a particular man will go and sweep through 30 to 40 women Right. And then just devastation after devastation after devastation, making babies here and there and not taking care of them, not providing child support, lying on the court forms. And then the woman ends up in a bad situation. And you would think, OK, maybe after the 10th one, he's caught on. No, he'll get to 30, 40 women. Even the same thing will happen. And he's still not applied anything. Right. And then it can be the reverse if it's a female narcissist. Right. You, as a man, have gone through 40, 50 female narcissists. You see what I'm saying? You've gone through about, uh, you've had the female narcissists, actually, and going through all of these different men, and you would think at some point in time, she would stop and say, what is the common, who is the common denominator? What is the common denominator in this relationship? Why do I keep going through this vicious cycle of men? You see what I'm saying? 
or either the narcissistic man. Why do I keep going through this vicious cycle of women and doing the same thing and destroying their lives? You see what I'm saying? Neither he catches on nor the female narcissist with the Jezebel spirit who what focuses on being a gold digger, right? And all the different types of uh, getting get the bag, so to speak, the money, getting all of his money, right? And any other type of free material wealth and possessions she can get her hands on, right? It's all about the money. It's all about the looks for the female narcissist with the Jezebel spirit. It's all about uh, wealth and prominence and all of that. Having the form of godliness, right? Denying the power thereof. Okay. And so then what we think about when we look at these verses that I just read, all of those verses that I read gives you the characteristics of who? Of a narcissist. You see what I'm saying? And the ones that's particularly the creepers, those are the covert narcissists. Those are the creepers, right? And so now we're going to talk about four ways that the narcissist creeps into houses, okay? And the first way that he creeps into houses is that he takes advantage of the fact that you are a silly woman. And you might think, oh, I hope you're not name calling and labeling. I'm ready to click off. No, the scripture calls it a silly woman. And what that basically means is that simple minded, being simple minded, that means you're caught up in black and white, all or none thinking and a fixed mindset. That's what a silly woman is, is simple mindedness, right? And a fixed mindset means that you think this is just the way it is. There's no way for you to expand your knowledge in any area. Your life is always going to be like this. It's like you are so far from thinking about growth in any area. That's what happens when you have that fixed mindset, no growth. And then because you think that you should have been born knowing everything that you need to know, you don't even try, right? Because that fear is there fear of failure, right? Perfectionism is where it also comes out, right? Because that's just, perfectionism is a cute word for trauma that's based upon your limiting belief. I'm not enough, right? And it has the root of fear, okay? And so in order to get out of this black and white thinking, which leads to judgmentalism and criticism, because that's part of perfectionism, okay? That's always a really bad side to a personality, um, some personality traits that we have, right? And so that judgmentalism and criticism comes in, but in order to get out of that, to start chipping away at that, one must have, uh, one must be self-aware. You have got to be self-aware, right? You got to be self-aware of the cycle that you're going through. And part of self-awareness is understanding that when you're grieving and you're sad, right? There are some times when that becomes too much, the grieving, the sadness, the depression due to grief or loss, right? Then what happens is that that judgmental slash critical side was set in. That's part of perfectionism. So being self-aware enough to know, wait a minute, when that part comes in, you don't want to go to a fight trauma response of expecting perfectionism out of everybody else. But you got to be able to be self-aware to understand what it is that's going on so that you don't blast out to everybody else and make it seem like they're the ones that need to be perfect because you are dealing with pain and anger, et cetera, right? And then you have to understand when that takes over. See what I'm saying? When you're self-aware, you understand, oh, it's, it's taking over this judgment of critical spirit. Then you're able to do the internal work, right? And then you're able to be able to, uh, how would I say, uh, navigate the relationships, navigate the conversation, navigate your grief and loss process moving forward is what I want to say, right? Simple mindedness also means that thinking all a man has to do is spend time with you every day, all day long, and say the typical narcissistic phrase, I've never, I've never met anyone else in my life like you. That's all he's got to do. Send you roses, spend thousands of dollars on food with you and shopping and hotels and giving you a good night, a good morning, a good afternoon and doing all of that and then being in bed with you. That means that he loves you. That's simple mindedness. Simple mindedness is also allowing uh, a man to creep in and out into these situationships in your life on special days like Valentine's Day, Father's Day, because he know you suffered abandonment. So he know that you're going to want somebody to be with you on those days. Right. Then with him on Thanksgiving Day to make 
uh, you guys look good, uh, make him look good rather to his family. Then on Christmas to make uh, you look good for your family. You see what I'm saying? He knows just when to get you going. And then New Year's Eve, okay? So of course, we got to bring the New Year in together, baby. So he's creeping and calling you up so that you can give away your body to him for New Year's Eve. That's simple mindedness. Simple mindedness is thinking a man can share two traumatic events and then lead you to share all of the traumatic events from your whole entire family history, right? And when he shares those two traumatic events with you, he falls all out on the floor, uh, starts this dramatic display of crying, crocodile tears and uh, wailing and all of that. And your family members are looking like, well, what is going on with this guy, right? Only person. And he then with this whole dramatic display, he is going to uh, make you think he can connect to his feelings, right? Oh, this is such a vulnerable man. I can't believe, you know, God has sent me somebody like this. And I finally have a man that I can connect to that soulmates, right? He got you thinking all of this. This is none but a creeper, a narcissist who's in what? Sheep's clothing, right? Okay, simple minded. That's a man coming to you and appearing to be the answer to all of your prayers. He can get you that cell phone. Baby, he can guarantee you. He can say, baby, I'll get you that job you wanted, that car you wanted. What can you want, baby? I, you know, I'll be the man of your dreams, right? He can take care of you. He can give you everything you need, everything you ever wanted and desired. The only person that can do that is God himself. Remember, the narcissist and their egotistic minds think that they are God, right? And so they do not come under human, human authority. They will not come under God's authority. Right. It goes back to what the scripture just what I just read, denying the power thereof. Now, we've already gone over number one. That's he knows you're simple minded. Right. That's why he can creep into your house. Number two, he knows you are laden with your own sins. So not only is he aware of the sins that he has going on, he is aware of your sins. Right. So you have a craving and you think all you got to do is just satisfy that craving. That's what's in your mind, right? So satisfying every craving, what does that look like? Being significantly overweight in some cases. Satisfying every craving could actually lead to anaphylactic shock, right? Satisfying every craving leads to trauma bonds and soul ties. Satisfying every craving leads to a narcissist creeper, the creepers, right? Stealing, killing, and destroying every single area of your life, right? He is after your soul. Eve thought all she had to do was take a bite out of the apple, right? You thought all you had to do was take a bite out of that man. It was going to fulfill all of your needs. She thought the apple was going to fulfill all her needs. You thought that creeper was going to fulfill all of your needs, right? It's being simple minded. It's being what the scripture calls a silly woman. Okay. Number three, he knows your soul is lusting for love and approval. Unchecked cravings lead to lust, right? We talk about this all the time. It leads to lust force and lust force always lead to took force. Took force are things that God did not ordain for you. You just took it for yourself. And took for us always lead to soul tie doors. And soul ties are simply connections. Addictions are soul ties, okay? And so remember when we talked about the lack cycle before, the lack cycle is that you've got love, approval, comfort, and knowledge addictions, right? And so what happens is that you inherited, you've got a seed of rejection inside of you, right? And so that seed of rejection ended up producing lust in your soul, which led to the love and approval addictions. The love and approval addiction started off, number one, because what? We all inherited the trauma from the Garden of Eden, okay? Number two, there were some cracks, so to speak, and deficiencies in your family's love story garden. Number three, there were cracks and deficiencies, right, in the soil of society's love story garden and how they displayed love to you as a whole, right? And so with all of these three areas coming into play, you ended up um, forming your own concepts of how love is. 
You've conformed lies about love. That love is restrictive. Love is devaluing women. Love is abandoning women. Love is abuse. You came up with your whole idea of lies about love, right? And so then you got the comfort addictions where they come in for the part of the lack cycle. When you're feeling grief, extreme sadness and languishing and neediness because your creeper is not providing, <laughs> he's not providing uh, for your needs, right? So your soul is languishing. He's future faked you so much, which future faking is not what? Number giving a person false hope. False hope is based upon false promises. False promises is based upon false evidence, right? So you've been future faked so long that all you got to do is do this, that, and other. You've been on that hamster wheel, and then it'll go back to the beginning, to the love bombing phase. Or he future faked and told you during the love bombing phase, you guys are going to have all of these material things, and then what? Come to find out you're not living that lifestyle that he promised you or either he love bombed you with and said that that was going to, you know, making it seem like that's how you guys are going to live going forward. OK, so it can be a combination of things of what he's future faking you on. But future faking leaves you on a hamster wheel. Right. You're striving. And then it leads you to the place of being in uh, extreme sadness. It leads you to sadness. And the sadness is not like a regular type of sadness. You're languishing. OK. Your soul is languishing. And the scripture says hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. So you're languishing because of the future fake, right? And that's another way of tying up your soul, which is another way of reinforcing the trauma bond, reinforcing the soul ties that he's already put there inside of you, right? And so with the comfort addictions, instead of saying, Holy Spirit, come, fill my heart, mind, and soul and spirit, help me, Lord because I feel like I want to do whatever it is you feel like you want to do and then allowing your body to go through the withdrawal of fainting for whatever you want. You say, instead of Holy Spirit come, you are saying person, place, thing, or idea come and fill me up. You see what I'm saying? And then you keep reinforcing uh, the trauma bonds and soul ties. And so your comfort addiction reinforces the approval addiction. The approval addiction reinforces the what? The love addiction. And you just keep going through the cycle, right? And then you numb out. You numb out by flighting. So when you get caught up in all your addictions, that's a flight tra trauma response. That's a flight trauma response. And also perfectionism itself, when you uh, decide you're going to flight when it comes to perfectionism, what you do is a form of escapism. Comfort addiction is a form of escapism. And part of the perfectionism is a form of escapism where you think, if I can just be the perfect wife, I can have the perfect kids, my house can be the perfect house. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I can be the perfect mom and the perfect this, that, and the other and do everything perfect. We're going to be okay. You see what I'm saying? Then I'm going to be enough. That's what perfectionism does. That's what any type of uh, addiction does, particularly comfort addictions. And then you've got the perfectionism. So you've got those addictions and the perfectionism, and you've got all of that stuff that you are uh, flighting, so to speak, as far as your trauma response. you got a lot going on. Long story short, right? And then so the last way that the narcissist creeps into your house, okay, is that he knows you have a knowledge addiction. That's the last part of the lack cycle. That K is for knowledge. While in the discard phase, he pulls the mask down and he shows you a little bit of himself, right, at a time, right? You knew something didn't feel right all along, but you ignore those red flags in the love bombing phase, right? But in that discard phase, he just slowly, slowly pulls that mask down. And he'll start telling you some stuff that's going to leave your mouth open, just right, wide open, right? And so um, all of this wild and crazy behavior had been going on. And it's still going on in the discard phase. Don't get me wrong. It's got ramped up way more than it was as you went through the love bombing and the devaluation stage. So right now it's at a whole nother level because, you know, pretty soon I'm getting ready to peace out of here, right? And so then what you do, you watch every, you read every blog post you can on narcissism. You watch every YouTube video from every Christian channel you can think of. You consume every quote and video on Instagram, right? You follow thousands of people on TikTok learning about narcissism, right? You got five and uh, six movies you've watched on toxic relationships, Christian movies, right? 10 to 12 books you've read on toxic relationships and narcissism in general. You could tell a person what a vulnerable narcissist is, what a covert narcissist is, what a classic, classic narcissist is, uh, what a communal narcissist is. You can tell them what a malignant, malignant rather, 
narcissist is. You can do all of that. But the thing is, you still won't move. There's a disconnect between your knowing and your doing. And he knows it. He knows once he's left your house, all he has to do is to say the right words. But you know, baby, I'm still in love with you. You know, I'm still in love. You know, she crazy. And she got this disorder and that disorder. But you know, I still love you, don't you? You know, I still love you and the kids. You see what I'm saying? That's all he's got to do is tell you that he still loves you. You know what I mean? And then what happens is you allow him to creep back in. He comes right on back in. And you may even, at this point, you might even be so desperate as to agree with a relationship with a uh, third person coming in or a fourth one. You see what I'm saying? It, it, is, it could just be ridiculous. But this is all because what? You've gotten to the point of having, uh, number one, what the scripture talks about, the silly woman, which is basically being simple-minded, right? The other part is what? Being laden with sins, right? Then number three, we talked about not only you being laden with sins, but you've got lust. And that lust is what? The love, approval, comfort, and knowledge addictions, right? So you've got all of that going on, that like cycle going on is, is the reasons why he's able to creep him his way back on in, right? And then you might say, okay, so if he's creeped back in all these different times, what do I do to get out of this creeping cycle, right? You got to have a be still and no moment. <laughs> You got to do things his way. And when I say his way, I'm talking about God's way. His way, the way you do it in that order is healing, identity, self-worth with affirmations. And the Y stands for yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit. You're yielding to it and partnering up with that work, okay? We like to do things our way. And that stands for opening up rejection with affirmations and yielding to pain. So we are open ourselves up. You know, we're saying all of the affirmations and which is like the cherries on top of the Sunday. But then we're like, oh, there's a disconnect. I still don't feel like I'm healing. You haven't dealt with all of that stuff from your family's love story garden. Right. And then from what society, you pe person of color, from what society has showed the way they've showed you love because of your skin color. You have to deal with all of that in order to be able to get out of that cycle. But if you are constantly going around like the Energizer Bunny, not stopping and coming up with a pain strategy plan, you're going to keep on being in the creeping cycle of the covert narcissist, right? And so the last thing that you would have to do after, uh, like I said, taking the be still and no moment, because in that be still and no moment, you're going to have stillness, right? That's going to lead to revelation of a come to Jesus moment, right? That revelation, that's going to, uh, in turn, kind of like a domino effect, uh, evoke a, a spirit of surrender inside your soul. And then you're going to surrender the, uh, your control to God. You're going to surrender the outcome of the relationship to God, right? And then that's when you're going to do things his way. But you got to take the be still and no moment, right? In order to have the uh, self-awareness and surrender to come in, right? And once those come in, then you're doing things his way, healing identity, self-worth with affirmations, yielding to the work and partner with the Holy Spirit, right? Then once that is done and over with, then what you're doing, that last thing is that you're going to have to be prepared to go through a wilderness season. And you might say, well, how long is that? That's for God, you and God to work out, right? Only God knows how long your wilderness season, season rather needs to be. Only God knows that. And so what happens is in the wilderness season is that God is preparing to take you to the next level. That next level inv involves uh, doing your calling, right? And walking out in your purpose and getting you to your destiny. He cannot do that unless you go through three things. And those three things are what? Number one, being purified from the toxins that have entered your mind, body, soul, and spirit, right? Purifying from all of those toxins, from being with the person has been who has been known as what the creeper slash covert narcissist. You got to be purified. Your whole mind, body, soul, and spirit has to be purified, and so does it. It's same thing for your children. They are no different. All of those uh, toxins that's been brought into your soul. The next part of that wilderness uh, season actually is going to be uh, purging. There's a purging that needs to come from your mind, body, soul, and spirit. That purging is all of those idols slash addictions. 
slash lust force, right? Slash soul ties. All of those idols have to be purged from your soul. Every idol that has been uh, placed in your soul, every idol and every addiction is a soul tie. It's all got to be purged out. You see what I'm saying? And then what happens is you want to work on pleasing. And you say, pleasing? I, I thought we, I, we're done with people pleasing. We are. <laughs> You've got to work on pleasing God and not pleasing man, right? First, your focus was on what can I do to get them to... Um, to think that I'm worthy, to think that, that I'm pretty enough, that I'm good enough, you know, that I'm smart enough, right? That I'm intelligent enough, whatever enough it is, <laughs> starting at the, the root of it, not enough, and then basically going down to fear. You've got to be ready to deal with those limiting beliefs and get those under control where you're no longer bleeding out from them. You see what I'm saying? Okay. And then after that, you can live a life of holiness, right? and uh, abundance and freedom. Your life will be based upon those three areas. It's a consecrated to God life, right? And it's, uh, you're no longer operating with, I'm not enough as your operating system. Your new operating system is love and freedom. And right. And then when you need to reclaim your power and soul and identity, you're doing things his way, right? And so the narcissist promised to give you everything that you ever needed and desire for, but only God, like I said before, only God can give that to us. No human being can satisfy or fill that void. No person, place, thing, or idea can fill that. Okay. You are enough. You do not have to go through continual cycles of allowing the narcissist to creep into your house all times of the day and night to prove that you are. Reclaim your power, soul, and identity today. Grab your keys to the kingdom and get your inheritance. If this message has affected you in any kind of way, any positive way, and helped for a renewal of your mind, body, soul, and spirit, anything in this message that has been of value, share it with someone else who needs to hear it. I believe in doing an A tie dash I. That means you wear a tie so you can make an impact, analyze, troubleshoot, implement empower and then finally you make an impact by sharing what you have learned with others god bless and until next time
give more than I could have known. valleys into places to learn instead of burn and perish away in nights never so cold without his grace how could I say that I've seen the world from his great love how could I know what he could love for me if I didn't give up and let him be my valley of grace where things would change and maybe they'd take up the cross high again the valley of grace never was the same after he had died Love that refined so much. So oh.